I was in um, Palo Alto on University Avenue, and I was in some stealth startup a couple of years ago, and it, it was a bunch of guys from Facebook who were doing a compression technology with no business model. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Were they and taking bong heads and stuff? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, have you... <laughs> Yeah, and I, I asked them if they'd seen the show, and they were like, they had no clue. They were just, it was the most hilarious thing. Those guys are pure celebrities in Silicon Valley right now. I mean, they premiere that show in Silicon Valley. Um, and and that they've done a great job of bringing out consultants to that show who know, um, you know, what's going on. And um, You should do a guest spot there. No, the goal is to not be a character in that show. <laughs> and, and I think they blew it. For me, because they took that guy Russ Hanneman and they based him on Mark Cuban and Shervin Pishavar, but they put these shirts on him. <laughs> so I think I'm safe. I think I'm out. Um, but we were talking about uh, Spadera compression. Oh, providing value. So, so I was spending time at Photo Bucket, and it didn't even occur to me I could be an angel investor there because I didn't have any money. Ultimately, my Photo Bucket uh, investment went on a credit card, two credit card checks actually. Um, and my second investment was Twitter, and I'd already been working with the Twitter guys on some stuff, and then Ev wrote me an email once, like, hey, we're doing a round, you're in for 25, 25, okay, cool, 25, and I was like, shit, I don't, 25, that's a lot of money. So I gave him the money, and then I needed to show up because I needed that money back someday. So I was like, well, shit, I better work and make sure I have some impact because I need to get this back, this is real money. Uh, but in each other company, I mean, I, I recently was looking back through early emails with Travis and Garrett about Uber, I think we worked on that thing for six months before we put any money into it. My, myself and my wife. Um, my wife, uh, I guess then she was my girlfriend, but uh, she helped do some of the initial branding and marketing and, and go to market type strategy. We we're both on product and naming the company and all this stuff before a round had ever closed. Mm -hmm. You know, Travis was staying at our house. Um, and, and I look back through all of them. Like you, you know, the, the Optimizely guys, the Lookout guys, Twilio, uh, Docker. These were all things where the investment didn't even come up in the first meeting. It was always like, what are you doing and what can we do for you? Mm -hmm. And so when that round ultimately comes together, there's going to be a spot there for you. If you've shown you can add some value, you're going to have a close enough relationship as an investor, you're going to have a close enough relationship with the founder that you don't even need a board seat. You're probably going to have more influence than mm -hmm. a board member and still not have to sit on the audit committee. And it's it's a much more meaningful job as a result. Mm -hmm. You know, we spend as much time as we can in our initial meetings with founders, getting to know the product, but getting to know them as people too. Mm -hmm. We ask questions like, how much debt do you have? Like, do you owe any credit cards? Where are you with your student loans? Like, what's your relationship like at home? What are you worried about? Do you still talk to your parents? Like, what's your fallback? Mm -hmm. Do you think about your fallback or not? Like, what's your, what's your goal for this thing? You know, is it gonna be big or is it gonna be a lifestyle business? Where do you wanna take it? How willing are you to do all? And like, we really just try and ask these founders these questions, some of which might even discourage them to not take this plunge right away. Mm -hmm. Some of them might reveal, hey man, this is a lifestyle business. Don't come for venture money right now. Mm -hmm. Some of them might you know, encourage somebody to go find a partner right. who maybe has more of that founder uh, DNA. But, but generally, we try and establish that bond very early on if we're here to provide service. That sounds like just good advice, even if you're not looking for funding. I mean, if you want to sell your product to a big prospect, just to go get to know the prospect really well, become their friends before you pitch your solution to them. Yeah, I, like I mean, I don't know what your, uh, your rules are for lurkers and, at HQ, but uh, you know, people always ask me, how do I break in? I don't know anyone. I'm like, just, just lurk, like just <laughs> be, go to the events and introduce yourself. And if somebody makes eye contact with you, go in for the shake. Uh, <laughs> an, uh, an old mentor of mine convinced me that uh, if somebody looks at you, that means they want to meet you. That's probably bullshit, but I believed it for enough years. And I was like, boom, I'm in. And, uh, but, but, you know, most people w want some help. Most people, I mean, man, look, I was at a political thing, um, like a political fundraiser for, for Hillary a few weeks ago. It was a fancy one in LA. There were a lot of fancy stars and like, I saw Ellen over there and I'm like, I'm not going to go say hi to Ellen and get the selfie. That's awkward. I don't know what I would talk to Ellen about. Then I saw some other fancy people milling about, and they were all just kind of standing there with their husbands and wives kind of doing this. And so we, my wife and I walked up and talked to a couple of them, and you could just see the relief, like, oh, thank God someone's talking to us. We don't feel like total fucking geeks here, right? Mm. And I was like, you're on the biggest show on television. 
and you just felt that awkward, right? And it occurred to me once again, it's a universal feeling, right? In any setting like this, people would love for you to come up and say hi. Maybe if they're somewhere on the Asperger spectrum, that's not true. But most people <laughs> would love for you to come up and say hi and, and, and engage in some way. And if they're building something, most people would love some help, some input, your opinion. They'd love you to volunteer. They'd love you to hustle a little bit for them. And so I actually think this is one of the most meritocratic societies in the world is a startup movement where people care a little bit less about where you went to school and a little bit less about where you grew up and more about what can you do for me right now. I am resource constrained. I am trying to move so goddamn fast. I am out of touch with these different constituencies. How can you help me right now? And if you're the kind of person who can prove their mettle that way, you'll find your way into a solid gig with some ownership and something you're passionate about. Because if you can find a role where you're helping, you're going to feel good about getting up and going to work every day and night. So you've also you mentioned the a binary outcome and. Um, you used to talk about how you should just either go for zero or go for a billion and nowhere in between. And then recently you've kind of talked a little bit about um, lifestyle business being actually a pretty good option for, for the founders, even though lifestyle business isn't, isn't particularly interesting to venture capitalists. And now that we're outside Silicon Valley and there isn't a lot of capital, what are, what are your, your thoughts kind of in the context of these secondary cities? Yeah, I don't think I've ever been one to say you should go for a billion or you should go for zero. What I think I've said is that's what a VC is looking for you from, right? Mm -hmm. So a VC has portfolio theory, meaning I've got eggs in a bunch of different baskets. And so I could just like, I, it is easy for me to sit in front of you and be like, go for it, swing for the fence. You're like, yeah, but we could sell our company for $50 million and net six, and that's a lot of fucking money. But a VC is going to be like, fuck that, that's, that's getting out early, let's do it, let's push the envelope, right? I grew up in a small town near Buffalo where like the richest guy, I, was at, I just caught up, my, my mom and dad live near me now and I was just catching up with them and I was like, hey dad, and I was kind of going back through the rich people in my town. I was like, how much money does that guy actually have? He's like, probably like $3 million. I'm like, no shit, that's like the richest guy ever. Like he ran things in town, right? That guy had a sports car, he had a big ass house, he like... To me, it was the epitome of rich, like $3 million is an unconscionable amount of money for almost everyone in the country. But $3 million is what Michael Arrington at TechCrunch famously called one of those dipshit exits, you know? Mm -hmm. I remember he called me up once. We were selling a company where each of the founders was going to net like seven or $800,000. And I was like, dude, they're 25 years old and they're going to have $700,000 in the bank after tax. Like, that's an amazing amount of money. He's like, that's bullshit. And my mom and dad don't like me repeating this, but I was like, Mike, my mom and dad would contract murder somebody for $700,000. <laughs> they would cut them up and dump the body. <laughs> like, like that, that is a real amount of money. And so I, what you may have heard me saying, because I, I don't think I've ever said, hey, just go for the billion or zero, and like, it's just a binary dice roll. Like, when you get into the venture game, the deeper you go, the more you're forced into those outcomes. It's either going to go public and you're going to be on a magazine cover or it goes away. And the venture capitalist doesn't give a shit because they're drawing a big fat salary and they've got other investments, right? There are amazing lifestyle businesses along the way. There's a business up in Truckee, California, where I live called Clear Capital. It's owned by three guys. Uh, they've got a couple hundred employees. They do like virtual appraisals using Google Maps and drive-bys and stuff like that. But they do. 60 million dollars a year of net cash flow to those three guys mm -hmm. done no shareholders no board just like a money hose pointed at their face you know <laughs> just, like and so i mean that's an amazing business right and that's like at the extreme end of a lifestyle business but Truckee, i think gives me a lot of perspective living up there with people who own their own business and when it snows they just hang up the hey gone skiing sign and they're happy and they're balanced and they have kids and the, it's a really nice community, and I think people have found that medium. And I think that is great. I, you know, my, my dad forwent, he's a small town lawyer, and he forwent ever making any money because he made it to every single one of my soccer games and plays. And, you know, say my mom, she was a professor who took every summer off to make sure we could go see the national parks and stuff. And I don't, uh, you know, I, I envy that life sometimes. That's mm -hmm. why I stepped, I mean, that's why I gave my firm to the Young Turk back there a couple years ago so I could do that with my kids. But... I absolutely worship the lifestyle business if it works for you. Mm -hmm. I think to have that kind of direct relationship with your customers and your employees and not constantly be uh, accountable to external stakeholders and instead be able to develop the business the way it feels right for you is just 
It's the most enviable of situations. Just, you should probably not take venture money if that's your course. You should probably figure out a way to bootstrap it or bank finance it and keep all these other people with very, I mean, the number one thing to think about when you're raising money, when you're hiring an employee, when you're trying to close a deal, is just, is a little bit of empathy for the other side of the equation. What is their scorecard? What do they care about, right? So, because nobody else knows what's on yours. It's strange, as you grow up, you're a kid and your parents are looking out for you. And they, they really can put themselves out of their bodies into yours and say, okay, this is what's gonna be best for this kid. And then your teachers kind of do that too. I mean, I, I really admire teachers and how generous they are and the empathy they have. And they're like, I really am gonna try and do what's best for these kids right now. And then as you get into sports, your coaches probably do that. If you get into college and your, your professors, if you have a bond with one or two professors that are pretty special, they're thinking about you, how to best develop your mind, how to best develop that next phase of your career. But then you get out and you look for that figure and they're not there. You assume and sometimes you attach to like that paternal and maternal figure and they're not there. Because as nice and benevolent as they are, they just don't know your scorecard and they kind of don't give a shit about it as much as they care about theirs. They've got a partner, they've got kids, they've got shareholders and a board they're accountable to, and it just doesn't align with the things you care about as much. And when you're sitting across from somebody trying to sell them something, you've got to know what is a win for this gal? What gets her promoted? What, how does she save face? If I end up taking her in the deal, how does she actually communicate up the chain that it worked out for them? If you're trying to sell your company to somebody, why would they want to buy it? What fear and what optimism compels them to buy that company? If you're trying to get somebody to work for you, you should know, are they here for the glory? Are they here for the ego? Are they here for the money? Are they here for the impact? Are they here because we have great benefits and a ping pong table? Why are they here? You know, NBC, uh, my show has done pretty well and I just re-signed on to another season. Congratulations. I, thanks. Uh, NBC came after me though for a show and um, I was like, all right, well this is flattering. I'll go take the meeting. I don't really want another job, but let's, uh, let me hear what you got. And they're like, okay, here's the thing. It's kind of like a Shark Tank, kind of like an apprentice, and you're the Donald Trump character. And I was like, hey, thank you very much. This is a great meeting. You know, like, just seriously? <laughs> seriously, you're gonna pitch me as the fucking Donald Trump? Like, have you looked at any of my tweets in the last, like, hour ever? Like, <laughs> but I think empathy is one of the core values that I think is missing, one of the core skills, I would say, that's, I think, missing from this game a little bit. You know, we look for founders who have worked shitty jobs. Uh, we won't hire anyone who hasn't worked a shitty job, it, like, at all. Like, we won't have anyone in our bank. We won't have anyone in our brokerage. We won't have a, a lawyer touch any of our business who hasn't had a horrible job at some point. And for founders, we found almost all of them can point to their very shitty, usually tipping job or grinding door-to-door -door sales job early on in their careers. Usually, our founders have played some level of sports that requires some level of of team camaraderie and, and collaboration. Um, usually, we find our successful founders have lived, traveled, or studied abroad extensively, and been exposed to other cultures, and they just know how goddamn lucky we all have it here mm -hmm. every day to turn on a tap and have clean water. It's something that I think a lot of people take for granted, but it's also, it's also a, a, a competitive advantage. I mean, our most exciting company right now is uh, it's called InVenture. It's based in Santa Monica, but operates in Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia. You download a client onto your phone and it instantly determines the credit worthiness, and, your credit worthiness, and will make you an instant mobile money loan on the spot. Okay. Most VCs I talk to don't even know that M-Pesa exists. They don't even know that mobile money systems outside of the United States are at least 10 years ahead of where we are, right? We're still fucking around with chip cards and waiting 15 seconds for that thing to clear. And these guys that, are texting each other That's like the latest technology too. Yeah, and they're texting each other money and the whole goddamn economy is, is working on it. And a middle class is being created right before our eyes and we're still screwing around over here talking about the blockchain. And so it's kind of amazing how insular it is. And yet, you know, our founder there was a gal who had time as an investment banker, but also worked at the UN and worked all over Africa and was just like, I can't believe nobody else sees this. And she's killing it. And not only is she killing it, it's fun. It, we all talk about diversity in our startups, but it's the most diverse company we have on a gender basis, on a sexual orientation basis, on a racial basis. Like, she doesn't just have black engineers, she has African engineers, which is fucking awesome. Like, I, it's, it's also just the coolest company to visit. Like you just want to be there because it's a nice place, right? And 
I think like the tech bro thing has gone a little too far. It's kind of amazing to just go there and hang out. But it's funny, we talk about this um, because after we spent a lot of time, or Shivani Saroy is her name, she's amazing. But after we spent a lot of time with Shivs, we started realizing, was we went back through our company, we don't, we don't have many entrepreneurs of color, we're working hard on that right now, but we have a fair number of companies headed by women. And we realized they're outperforming. And we we're trying to figure out why. And one is we just figured out, and this isn't necessarily measurable, but we just liked being at those board meetings in those, in those companies better, better cultures, um, more inclusive, more celebratory, it was fun. But two is what we found is that they're building shit for audiences that VCs traditionally ignore. Mm -hmm. Like I think there is a straight up greed case for diversity. So forget hundreds of years that we've oppressed people of color in this country, forget the pennies on the dollar that we pay women, and the culture that they're raised in. Literally, if you had, if you just had, if your heart was just made of steel and you didn't give a shit about any of that, like just plain old Scrooge McDuck would have a basis for going after diversity. Because we are finding in businesses like Shivani's that nobody else fucking knows what's going on in Sub-Saharan Africa and she's nailing it. She's nailing it whilst being benevolent. It's a, it's a certified B Corp, so she's looking out for everybody there and also just printing money right now. We have uh, Melody McCloskey at Style Seat, who, it was funny, my wife and I put $50,000 into her company. It's, it's basically Uber for salons, and I am allowed to say Uber for because Travis Kalanick was her initial advisor, and, um, but uh, all these other Uber fours are bullshit. Um, but, <laughs> but hers literally is a booking engine for salons and stylists. Um, and my wife and I put 50 grand into her uh, because we just knew her hustle and we knew she was strong, and, Smart, and then, but my wife wasn't there for the final pitch. She had to do something, so I came home and I was like, hey, we did that deal with Melanie. She's like, what's she building again? I'm like, oh, it's this way that independent stylists can control their whole destiny and they can take their contacts from salon to salon, and so it frees them from the indentured servitude of a salon, and it um, you know, allows them to sell through some product to their customers and stuff, and she's like, oh, that sounds great. And I said, yeah, but we only put in 50 because I don't know how big that market is. And she's like, what do, you, what do you mean? And I said, well, I don't know how much people spend to get their hair cut. She's like, Chris, I have a question. What do you think the average woman like we know spends to get their hair cut? I'm like, well, I don't know. Supercuts charged me 1950, so I don't know. You got twice as much hair, 40 bucks? And, yeah, you know. Um, and so she laughs and laughs and laughs, and then she's like, I got another question. You know all that shit we have in the shower next to your bullshit, like all those products and everything. What do you think those cost? My wife has straight, she's half Asian, so she just has straight black hair. I'm like, I don't know, I like that shampoo and that conditioner, I don't know, like 10 bucks each. Ah. I was like, she had one more question. She's like, all right, all right. Which of our friends do you think is actually blonde? <laughs> and I'm like, uh, Marissa Mayer? She's like, no, no, no. Like, no. She's like, it, like, down the list. She's like, no, no. Here's the thing, man. Those cuts are like 150 to 200 bucks. That's $150 worth of product in the shower. That's a three to five hundred dollar color every few weeks. She's like, "Are you kidding? You had no idea, really?" And so I go back in to meet with Melody. I'm like, "You gotta teach me this business, girl, because I don't get it." And so not only do I learn all about white hair, but then I learn all about black hair. I learn about extensions and weaves and relaxers. And I learn about the women in the black community who do a lot of this work out of their house. But the main barrier to entry there is that it's really expensive to buy the supplies to do this stuff. And so a lot of women who are living check to check can't necessarily get their hands on these supplies. So if you have an opportunity to finance weaves and extensions, et cetera, then suddenly you've empowered this whole new generation of businesswomen to work out of their houses. And I start to learn about Asian hair and digital perms, these new machines that can actually put curls in Asian hair. I learn about this whole business. And so I get really excited. We put in a bunch more money. I'm like, Melody, I'm going to introduce you. All my friends are going to pitch up and down Sand Hill Road. And she pitches to a bunch of guys in khaki pants and blue blazers, and she comes back empty handed. I'm like, what just happened? She's like, well, I think they all pay 1950 for their haircut at Supercuts, too. <laughs> so, so we bought more of the company, and we bought more after that, and we bought more after that, and now they're killing it. And that's going to be one of our bigger ones. And we've just seen this again and again, these, these women and these people of color who have very diverse perspectives on audiences that have huge spending power, yeah. unique contributions to culture, and yet traditional hierarchy doesn't have any exposure to them. Yeah. I mean, Twitter is black Twitter. So, and I'm saying that because black Twitter calls itself black Twitter, but black Twitter is where all the hashtags originate from. Black Twitter is where all the memes come from. So, and yet, you know, who did the Running Man challenge recently? Anybody? Yeah, that's black Twitter, man. So, and yet we have 
no black executives, no black representation on the board, and you wonder why that company's flagging. You wonder why it doesn't know what's going ahead. There are yeah. no young people on that board. Head of, head of diversity. Our head of diversity is white. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was shocking to me. Um, a man? It's a man. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, he, he, yeah, I, I, don't, I mean, he's gay. I don't know. I, I, I guess he's out, he's out and gay, and so I don't. It's, um, but that's one step in the right direction. He worked that job at Apple. Um, I would. I mean, yeah, my jaw still dropped about that mm -hmm. after all this discussion, et cetera. It's been frustrating to say the least. And I think it hurts the bottom line. It's not just something to do to be polite. I think it hurts the bottom line. I mean, this drives me crazy with youth too. Like, I think you can't have a company like a Twitter and not have young people in the room who were Snapchat native, right? You have to have them around you at all times to know what the hell you're building. Otherwise, you're just building for old people. Like, you can't expect to continually be pushing the envelope if you just surrounded yourself with people who look and talk like you That's right. from the same geography, et cetera. So it's a long rant, but I think, you know, frankly, I like to think we're doing the diversity thing for the right reasons, but I also like to think we're getting fucking rich because of it. <laughs> so there's... There's 200 young people who are all ambitious. They want to be successful and wealthy. They want to have beautiful families. Someone on the other side of that and have accomplished all those things. You have all of this wisdom and also all of you have access to do anything you want. The, now, the problem is you have an overabundance of choices that you have to make of how you spend your time. What, how are you spending your time these days? What is important to you? Well, I, th I think no matter whether you're me or anybody else, you have to ruthlessly guard your time. Um, you just, money doesn't buy you any more of it. In fact, it probably distracts you because now you got more shit and more shit just means more work, um, more stuff to more houses or planes or whatever you're gonna, cars, whatever you're gonna have, it's just more shit. So I don't even think it correlates to, that's one of the reasons why it doesn't correlate to happiness per se. I think the latest studies have shown like, between zero and 60 grand a year, money does correlate to happiness, but after that it falls off, and it's, and it's not just positive for anything. Um, I, I had one conversation recently with one of our founders who, um, she's a woman and she was really worried about how many years she was gonna have to put off having a kid while building a company. And Matt and I sat down and were like, look, there's never gonna be a great time, so just fucking do it now. And she's like, but we're launching now. And I'm like, just fucking have the kid. Like you're." You can't postpone the rest of life because you've got some shareholders to look after, right? And what we found is actually, I found this both at Google, where I worked with Sheryl Sandberg a lot, and I worked with uh, Susan Wojcicki, who now runs YouTube. I found that, frankly, a lot of moms are just really good at managing their time. Mm -hmm. They kind of don't have time for bullshit because they've already got so many draws on them. And so Susan would just like, five o'clock be like, mm, meeting over. I'm out of here, if you've got more to say, email me and I'll be back on email at 8.30 when the kids fall asleep. Mm -hmm. And she was just ruthless about it. And it's why she's one of the most successful executives in Silicon Valley history. Mm -hmm. Cheryl, you've, if you've read Lean In and you read anything about her, and by the way, watch her graduation speech she gave this weekend at Berkeley, it's totally amazing. It's the first time she talks about the loss of her husband. Um, but Cheryl was just the same way. She, you know, even working with Zuck in a place where, famous for getting locked in and staying up all night on ProVigil or whatever, uh, Cheryl would, would leave at six and just be like, nope, kid time, husband time, food time. She would cook the own, like her own meals at home and just be like, and I'll log back on an email later and check in and then I'll turn it off and be present with my family. And I think it actually just makes you better. So if, you, if you really look at your day, really look at your day right now, and if you were to journal every single minute you spent today, like, what you did when you woke up, checking your email, and checking your tweets, and checking your Facebook, and checking your Snapchat, and checking your Instagram, and checking your nuzzle, and getting all through your stack there. And then, like, bullshitting around, and checking the news, and checking the weather, and, you know, your time spent commuting, and your time doing this and that. Like, the reality is, man, like, most of your day is spent not moving the needle. Most of your day is spent not getting anything actually done. Most of it is spent playing defense to what the world wants from you. Most of it is being a victim to your dopamine addiction. If you can do anything at all to curtail that at some point, not check the phone first thing in the morning. Wait till your tweets have stacked up for a little bit. Use Nuzzle so that you don't have to use Twitter all day long. 
to go ahead and, and actually consolidate those conversations you have with people so they're not just calling you, but you have your do not disturb time on your phone to get your workout in and make sure that your endorphins are up, et cetera. The more you can do that, the more you'll find, strangely enough, there's just more hours in the day. There's more time to be kick ass and there's more time to be totally present with your kids. Um, that was, it was funny. My wife and I in the beginning of having our first kid really, really resisted the idea of having a nanny. We were like, man, all these people, these kids are raised by nannies. They don't even know their parents' names and stuff like that. We're like, we won't be those people. But then what we found out was between the two of us, both working from home trying to raise a kid, we were both half-assing our work and half-assing our kid. And so one of the things we did is we had a nanny come in for a few hours a day so we could both go heads down and jam, 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 and then turn the computer off and be dad of the year because I was just there, not checking my phone all the time with my kid. And I think being much more aware of your attention and your presence will find extra hours in all of our days, and not just hours to crank out more bullshit email, but more hours to really, really invest in our, in our partners and our friends and our family. The other thing I would say is, look, email's free. In an ideal world, it would cost money to send email. But email's free, and just because somebody sent you one doesn't mean you have to reply. In the early days of my career, I wanted to be that guy who replied to everyone because I remember being the young guy trying to get on everybody else's radar. But if I do that, I will not get anything done. I will not look after the constituencies who matter to me. I will not help my family, my friends, the people who've partnered with us, the companies we work with, my community. I won't do any of that because I'll just be living in my fucking inbox. Studies show that every single message that comes in, whether it's from someone you know or not, actually triggers a dopamine release. It feels like a little dose of a drug. It's kind of like cocaine. And so you sit there and you stare at that inbox and you get another dopamine release when you hit send. And you can solve everybody else's problems all day and still not get anything done for yourself. This is one of the reasons why at the beginning of my career as a VC, I actually moved away from Silicon Valley. And not to like, you know, a hub like Raleigh or anything like that. I, I moved to Truckee, like a, a town of a few thousand people in the woods. And everyone's like, what the hell are you doing? And I just realized that San Francisco for me had become a series of coffees. Just one after the other after the other. Some were pitches, some were ketchups, but at the end of the day, not only was I like pre-diabetic from all the sugar in the goddamn coffee and wired on the caffeine, but I had just been like, I have no voice, I've been talking all day and I have done nothing. I haven't written what I wanted to write, I didn't take that gal out on a date, I didn't work out today, I didn't do all the things on my scorecard, my things, because no one else gives a shit about that. Everybody else sees what they can get from me, but nobody cares what I actually need or want, and so I moved out up to, to Truckee, to a modest house in the woods up there. And I just, um, I just started picking and choosing the people I wanted to invest in as friends, as relationships, and inviting them up to the woods and saying, look, come stay with me, let's break bread, let's go skiing, let's go for a hike, let's drink some beers, and let's catch up. First of all, it builds deeper relationships with founders than you'll ever know. Um, but it also, uh, it also reveals the kind of people you'd never want to do business with. There was, there was one guy I won't name, you know his name, but I won't name him, but he never lifted a finger or did a dish. And fuck that guy, we never invested. Um, <laughs> like, just horrible house guests. Why would you ever want to invest in a horrible house guest? But, uh, but for me, what it allowed me to do is get on my own to-do list now. And I could say like, you, Travis, I want to know you better. Come up to our house and let's stay. And Travis can spend eight hours in a hot tub, so that was pretty funny. We put a whiteboard next to our hot tub for TK in the early days of that. Hey, Evan Williams, come up here and spend some time. Hey, Sistrum, hey, uh, you know, the founders of Loku. Like we just, we ran it, we ended up buying the house next door and just run it as a retreat for entrepreneurs all the time. But we really got to know these people meaningfully. And, and in the meantime, everybody who asked for a coffee or a pitch, I'm like, hey, actually, weirdly, I don't live in San Francisco. Can't make it, you know? And if they even found their way to truck, you'd be like, hey, it's strange, I'm not here today. Um, but why don't you send me your deck? Because as an investor, you get into that meeting and usually in the first three minutes, you can tell whether you're leaning in or not. And then you're like, now am I morally obligated to do another 57 minutes of this shit? And you know, it's hard to be like, time's up, you're out. Like, it's not the gong show, right? I gotta sit there. It's, sorry, the gong show reference is old, uh, sorry. But, but I gotta sit there and wait this thing out. And that's a horrible use of my time and it's not a great use of your time either if I'm not gonna invest. And so just be ruthless, ruthless, ruthless with your time. I was reminded of this recently, one of my best friends who's in our uh, startup world, an incredible guy. He's worked in a couple of our companies and we've done investing together. And 
we vacationed together. He just found out um, a couple weeks ago uh, that he had stage four cancer and metastasized over his whole body. And you know, his daughter's the same age as our daughter. And he's fighting, and you know, there's uh, he's working really hard at it. And he's got the best doctors at it. But it's one of those things where it's like he's very similarly situated to me, and yet he may have very limited time on his hands, mm -hmm. right? And it's fun to get the attaboys from everybody else in the Valley, and it's fun to show up on some lists and stuff sometimes, but nothing's more fun than my girls crawling under my bed in the morning. And nothing's more fun than, you know, the birthday surprise my wife lined up for me. And nothing's more fun than blowing out candles with my mom and dad on the cake and hearing them tell stories about when I was born and stuff like that. Like, you, there's no amount of money that buys more of that, no amount of money that can buy you that time. So it's at the end of the day, it's, it's friends and family. Yeah, and, and people we work with who mm -hmm. become friends. Mm -hmm. I mean, the way we go about business, a lot of these people just become friends. They, if you're going to spend that kind of time and you're going to be that helpful and you're going to be that mutually vulnerable, it's going to lead to a friendship. And so it's kind of funny how that, that circle ends up, that Venn ends up intersecting. Where, um, But, yeah, we have a real hierarchy. I have a hierarchy with my assistant when I look at my email, which is just like, Family gets flagged. Family gets an immediate response at any time of the day in any format. Then actual friends are next. And then it's actual companies you work with. Then it's investors. And then most everybody else doesn't get a reply. And I am sorry, blanket apology. But I got other shit to do. I got my kids. I got my wife. I got making sure I don't have a heart attack. I got like a life. I got things I want to do. I like this television show. It's fun. I got shit I want to write. Like, and I just can't reply to every goddamn email. And neither can you. It's not a celebrity thing. Neither can all of you reply to every email. You shouldn't. There's so many of them that are bullshit. Just ignore them. Like, Tim Ferriss was right in his four-hour work week book, you know? Nobody dies because they ignored some email. I worried about his four-hour body book because I think somebody could die if they t t shoot themselves the wrong, you know, supplement. But, but nobody dies if you ignore your email. Just do it. Speaking of time, um, Thank you. We're, first of all, really grateful that you're here today and yeah, giving us a lot right of your on. time. Well, he, he, he's going to give us a little bit more time than we, he originally planned to. And I wanted to go ahead and switch over and start looking at some of the questions that you sent us through, um, through uh, Twitter. Um, but how about we take a couple from the, the audience?